To boot up here. Hey, look, it's booted up. Okay. Yeah, that's the ticket right there. Sorry. Okay. Hey, when you have the toys and you have nothing better to do but fly on an airplane, deal with a lot of slow damn animation. <laughs> right, this is going to be an introduction to computer viruses. Um, I actually was going to ask this question up in New York, and so I'm going to ask it here. Um, by show of hands, how many people here have actually written computer viruses? Okay. All right, now, how many federal officers in the audience are actually keeping track of how many people wrote computer viruses? Okay, now how many hackers are keeping track of the federal officers? All right. Hey, look, I can press the button again. Okay, this is the introduction to computer viruses. Um, how many people made my talk last year on viruses? You don't count because you're my friend, but hey, thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is actually the updated version with animation <laughs> and some new information. I'm taking all the damn animation out of these slides because it's already pissing me off, okay? <laughs> all right. The things we're going to cover in this talk are uh, boot sector viruses, multipartize, viral infectors, macroviruses, Trojan horses, fakes, and Visual Basic Scripts. <clears throat> Why am I dealing with Visual Basic Scripts? Well, it's obvious. Um, how many people got hit by I Love You? All right, now how many people aren't raising their hand because they're embarrassed that they got hit by I Love You? Yeah. OK. Uh, the I Love You virus, uh, when it hit, um, actually was quite devastating. It, it, it did quite a bit of damage. Well, not damage per se. It just had a nice tendency of changing all your uh, you know, music files, your, you know, <laughs> and your porn. Yeah. Well, poor guys out there just lost like five gigs of JPEGs. It's like, oh, damn. Oh, my god. I lost the whole redhead section. Jesus. <laughs> Back to the news groups, down low, down low, down low. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty nasty. Not nearly as nasty as the variants that followed it the weeks later. But I'm ahead of myself. We'll get into that. Oh, yeah, and computer viruses in the future. See, stupid animation has to go away. That's how it is to it. Um, at the end of this talk, when I talk about the computer viruses in the future, uh, that's when I'm going to discuss uh, what I discovered here. Uh, by an individual. Is Steve in the audience? There you are. You're the man who told me the information. Okay, we're going to be talking a lot this year. You know that, right? Okay. Uh, I'll be introducing Steve here uh, near the end of the talk here. Um, give me some troubling information, um, and I'm going to be doing some serious research on it uh, over the year. We're going to start with boot sector viruses. Boot sector viruses <coughs> aren't seen as much as they used to be. Uh, back in the days of DOS, uh, boot sector viruses were extremely rampant. We're going to cover how they work, what to look for, ways to remove them, and the animation. All right. The way boot sector viruses actually work, <clears throat> you have three parts of the boot sector. And I got my trusty laser pointer here. You actually have the code section here, the fat partition information, and the marker, which is 55AA. Now, what happens is the code s sequence here on the boot sector, 
when the uh, system uh, works up. Remember in the old DOS days, you don't see as much today as you did in the old DOS days where you type in a wrong command and it says syntax error or you know, you know, some type of an error code or whatever. That was this right here, the code. That was telling the computer how to respond depending on what you typed in or depending on how uh, things access memory, yada, yada, yada. Okay? Make sense? Anybody lost? Good. Bye. <laughs> With that partition information, check uh, track of all your directory structures. You know, as you sat there and started going down the tree structure, it kept tra track of uh, where the directories were placed on the hard drive. It kept, you know, all the memory allocation stuff, on, just everything, all your files, everything. It kept track of everything. It's a nice little database. Think of it as a database. And this is the marker, which tells it where to start. I should probably push a button. You know, just this animation stuff, man. Hey, look, it's divided into three parts. Hi, <laughs> on the record, PowerPoint just pisses me off. <laughs> Hello. Okay. The virus first copies the boot code onto a different uh, different sector of the media. Um, what happens is on the on the hard drive itself, on the boot sectors, uh, you actually have multiple sectors. Several of those sectors are not used uh, by other programs. They're actually set there and kept in reserve. Um, and what the virus writers would do is they would have the virus copy the code sequence itself, just take that whole block, and they would copy that to like sector 7, 9, 12, 17, 22. These are common sectors that are not commonly used, so it's a safe area to go through all of this code because you need this code to boot up. Okay? Without this code, system won't boot. Yeah, I know this part. Okay, like I said. At that point, it then copies uh, its code, the new virus code, over this code. So this on the uh, boot section portion is gone. This is now the virus code here. At the end of the virus code here, it actually points to the different sectors that it copied to. What some of these viruses would actually do is they would sit there and say, check sector 7 and see if there's any code there. If there is, copy over to uh, sector 9. If there's code there, go to 12. Why would they do that? Can anybody give me a guess on why they would actually check for different sectors that these sectors weren't commonly used? Well, you raise your hand so I can call on you. Didn't you go to school? Okay. Yes. Exactly. That means you can be multiply infected. What they would do is they would say, hey, there's already code in sector 7. Let's go to 9. Uh, good rule of thumb here. If you're dealing with a boot sector virus and you uh, boot from a clean floppy, because we would always boot from a clean floppy and not trust an antivirus software that's infected, <coughs> would we? Um, I've actually come across uh, machines where I've run a scan against them, found a boot sector virus, removed it and cleaned it uh, successfully, and just for shits and giggles ran it again and found another boot sector virus, and then again and found another one. Uh, I've, I've been able to actually infect it four times with uh, uh, a single machine, four times with four different boot sector viruses. Um, machine didn't run very well, by the way. <coughs> I went for a different animation. All right, the fat partition information of the MBR holds the data and partition information of the disk which we covered earlier, remember? So it has all your directory structure and your tree structure in there. Now, some viruses are particularly evil. <laughs> Not just evil, but they're evil, right? What they'll actually do is they'll encrypt the pat, uh, pat and partition information. So the virus code would run, and at the end of the virus code itself, it would actually de-encrypt the fat partition information, and then run over to like sector seven or nine, and actually run the boot sequence, and then your system would boot up. So if you remove the virus incorrectly, the virus isn't there to decrypt the fat and partition information. So you go, woohoo, I got rid of the virus, and all of a sudden you're going, what do you mean you can't boot? 
And then you're going, oh shit, and you boot up off a floppy disk, you hit the drive and drive not found, and you're going, okay, this is bad because I'm missing all my porn now, you know, and I got all these JPEGs and they're not there anymore, and, you know, I'm saying that for his benefit. <laughs> Because most of us would not have porn on our hard drives, right? Yeah, we back it up. <laughs> no. Because you can't reinstall the virus. Because the drive doesn't exist as far as the operating system is concerned. Uh, my absolute favorite virus is the monkey virus. Because that's exactly what the monkey does. Monkey B. Anybody been infected with monkey B? All right, repeat after me. Monkey is a bitch. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a big hairy bitch. <laughs> big bodite bitch, damn thing. <laughs> There's different ways of actually removing viruses without using antivirus software. And the monkey won't let you do any of them. The monkey is just flat out evil. Absolutely freaking evil. And I love it. It's just, I thought it was brilliant. What Monkey does is it, it does that. It, it loads into uh, the code, encrypts the fat partition information, uh, and it requires it to, move, uh, to be removed. You know, or actually, to remove it, you, it requires you to actually know the code key. What some of these antivirus software companies did, and I honestly it was brilliant. It was a very great idea. What they did is they created something called a simulator. <coughs> Anybody know what a simulator is? Good. What the simu hair, long hair, it doesn't work. Okay. What the simulator does, it says, hey, I'm going to copy to another diskette here. I'm accessing another drive. The number one rule for a virus is you must replicate. You have to replicate or you're useless, which is how you got the virus in the first place. So the first thing Monkey would do is it says, right on, I'm going to replicate. It starts going through the de-encryption scheme to de-encrypt itself, because the code itself is encrypted also. Now what happens is the simulator would be watching the code go for the de-encryption scheme on the fat partition information. It would stop the process inst instantaneously, grab the de-encryption scheme, de-encrypt the virus, and remove it. Now, I don't know about you, but that's impressive. That's brilliant. Uh, for a long time, McAfee, you would have the an McAfee antivirus product and if you're infected with Monkey, you actually had to download the Monkey Remover, which wasn't a DAV file, it was a separate product altogether, uh, because Monkey was that complicated. Um, I'm not really sure whether or not it's still that way, because um, I've only been infected with Monkey once, and that was on purpose. We already covered that. Duh. Okay, we're going to go over some of the things to look for, in case you think you're um, infected here. <clears throat> you can, uh, one of my favorite tools back in the old DOS days is uh, Norton Utilities um, from Symantec. Uh, one of the reasons why I like Norton Utilities, aside from that, was like had some really cool tools and people were like, hey, what's that, you know, was they had a thing called a disk editor. Anybody use it? All right. It rocked. That disk editor was fantastic. It was a, it was a graphical uh, description of your drive. And I used the disk editor to go to uh, the first boot sector, you know, with the, you know, the MBR, and I would look at the code. And then I would use my right arrow key and start hitting the different sectors. And as you're going through the different sectors, those sectors should be blank. The code on the, on the right hand, because you'll look at the uh, box here, and then it'll have all this, like, like hex code on the side here. And if you didn't see any code, that means there was nothing on those sectors. Well, I go through the drive and I just start, you know, paging, you know, sector after sector after sector. And if I saw a copy of quote unquote code from the first sector, I knew I had a virus. The other thing to look for was changes in memory usage. If for some reason you were sitting there working away and the next thing you knew, your system's running really, really slow. And I know this is really hard to tell when you're dealing with Windows now. But for DOS, it was really obvious. You know? It's like, God, Windows is running real slow. And it's like, and it's crashing a lot. Maybe I have a virus. No, you just have Windows. 
you know? And the thing is, is I really can't cap because I use Windows. Um, and people are going, shh, shh, shh. I'm going, hey, look, I use Windows, I use FreeBSD, I use Solaris, I use Linux. Why? Because if you really, really want to know the ins and outs, you need to know all operating systems. Just a little preaching. And besides PowerPoint, so Hex or Elite, cool. Yeah, goddamn animation, man. All right, look for strange behavior in the OS. I know, no jokes, we're dealing with Windows. <laughs> Uh, the way I mean by strange behaviors in the OS, um, let's go back to like the old DOS days. There was a, a, DOS, a boot sector virus um, that really only, it only affected XTs and 286s, so you will never see it again, except for those of us who still have XTs and 286s in our lab because we're too damn cheap to donate them or like use them for boat anchors. Um, this was a really cool virus. It was called the mu uh, Music Boot Virus, and it was really kind of cool. I loved it. Uh, when I worked for an antivirus company, um, I was testing all these different viruses, uh, which was a blast. Uh, and I came across this one, and I was just dying to see what it did. And it was, you could not tell that you had the virus. You, it, you, know, you would sit there, and you would be working on the system, typing commands, and then the whole system would just freeze. And then the PC speaker would go, do, 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 do. And then everything would work again. You're going, what the hell was it? <laughs> okay. I'm up late, it's no big deal, and you'd be working around, and it was random, so it doesn't, wasn't happening on a regular basis, and you'd go like a day or two, and nothing was happening, it's like, what the hell, it was like, all right, and it was no big deal, and there was some glitch in the program, you'd be working on something else, trying to play some type of game, freeze, and you're going, okay, you know, something's wrong here, god damn it, you know, what is that with that, and you're going, now, I know the speaker is not supposed to do this, and you know, you're standing back going, it's Satan, it's possessed, it's evil. You know, we're like, here, Mom, you touch it. Make me change the garbage you you know? And uh, it was a pretty harmless little virus. After a while, it would actually just completely and utterly crash your system, and you'd have to reboot your system, which was annoying, but it really didn't do any damage. It was just cute. So, um, that was my favorite back then. I just thought that was kind of fun. Just something to annoy the hell out of somebody. Uh, does anybody remember the rabbit virus on Macintosh? Yeah. I can remember being at a company working on your Macintosh and this little bunny goes jumping across your screen and you're going, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> and you're thinking to myself, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, like, hey, what the hell is this rabbit doing on my screen? Okay, maybe I did see that. What the hell was that? You know? And it would actually go through the network and jump around through people's screens. It was pretty cool. <laughs> but, you know, hey, once again, it was, you know, Macintosh. So. <laughs> all right, different ways to actually remove boot sector viruses. Uh, one of the easiest commands to use for, like, New York boot or anti-exe, well, anti-exe is kind of like a different story because anti-exe is more of a multi-partite um, virus, and we'll actually get into that. But anything that's a solid boot sector virus that does not encrypt, all right, everybody repeat after me, does not encrypt. That was a cue, come on. Does not encrypt, right. Because if you run this on a virus that encrypts like monkey, game over, thanks for playing. What fdisk slash mbr does, everybody, anyone actually use this command? Man, you guys rock. You guys are awesome. All right, for those of you who have never used this command, all it does is it says, I don't care what code is there. I don't care what it is. Just replace it with brand new code. Okay, great. Game over. So the virus is there. Your copy of the boot sector stuff is on like another sector, and it says, I don't care about any of this. Boom. The virus is gone. Simple as that. You boot up with a uh, with a boot disk. Site. Type in F disk slash MBR. Virus gone. No problem. I mean, and it's gone. Be careful. Identify the virus first. Um, I want to see what happened if I did it with Monkey. I should have taken the data. I actually wanted off that drive first <laughs> because I'm going. Well, I bet you I can still recover. I'm positive I can. And um, well, you can, but. It was hard. Yeah. Um, which are, which would you be able to tell if it was encrypting based on whether or not you could access your hard drive when you was off of the No. Well, yes. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I never tried that, but now, damn it, I'm going to have to go try that. Um, 
Yes, by theory that would be true, because if it's an encrypting uh, factor and you boot off of a clean floppy, you will not be able to see the hard drive. So yes, without testing, that's true. So there's your test. Boot off of a clean floppy, try to access the C drive if you can get a directory structure. It's not encrypting. F test slash MBR. Woo! Game over. Man, I need more sleep. <laughs> Will remind me to take the damn animations out of my slide presentation, okay? That's one of my roommates. Okay, the other way to do this, if you actually want to take some time to do it, and you want to be like hacks or elite kind of, you know, uber dude, <laughs> and you don't feel like you want to type in fdisk slash mbr, all you have to do is find the sector that has your old code with a uh, disk editor, copy and paste it back over the, uh, the original code, and That'll do it also. But if just slash MBR is a lot easier, but that's the you know the elite slow. I got tons of time on my hands, and my wife's out of town. Time way to do it. And of course, antivirus software. Honestly, antivirus software is your best friend. Um, the viruses that we have today are a lot more destructive, uh, a lot more plentiful and a hell of a lot easier to spread than they used to be. Um, back in the days, I'm going to date myself here, uh, of SneakerNet. How many people here know SneakerNet? <laughs> you old farts. For those of you who doesn't know what a SneakerNet is, go ahead and raise your hand. The kid. <laughs> we have a small kid here. I don't know what SneakerNet is. Wasn't the internet around since, like, God? <laughs> Depends on who you think God is. Um, in the old days of SneakerNet, basically to transfer files is copy to a diskette, pull it out of the drive, walk over to your buddy and go, here's the file. <laughs> Get what changes and walk back over to your computer, stick it in your drive, and pull it up. Boot sector viruses were amazing for this because a way you can infect a diskette with a boot sector virus. I just had to, I'm sorry. It's my talk, I can do whatever I want. Okay, um, back then, boot, sectors, uh, boot sector viruses were the most prevalent viruses there were. 80% of the virus infections were boot sector viruses. This is not true today, but back then it was. Um, because all you have to do is do a directory on a diskette and you infect it. If the disk gets infected, all you have to do is say acorn, Hit return. As soon as it accessed the disk, your drive was infected. And the way you could actually tell a diskette was being infected, that's great. If you put a diskette in a drive now and you say uh, directory A colon, and it goes and it gives you your directory. If you have, if you have an infected diskette, you go directory A colon, and you're going, what the hell is that? It's actually grinding down in there, you know, it's like, no, well, you didn't make that noise a few minutes ago. That's another uh, clue, people. If you do a directory on a diskette, and it starts grinding, and it gives you this horrible grinding sound. Um, oops. One thing I'd like to add here real quick. Uh, let's, let's hold the questions, if we can, to the very end, so um, I don't get too far over time here. Um, although all your questions have been absolutely fantastic, especially yours. That was a really good question. Um, Start focusing on your antivirus software. Uh, I would say the majority of people install antivirus software on their systems and they never update the DAP files. Okay? Seriously. How many people here, and don't be embarrassed, I swear to God, don't be embarrassed. I, I really want to see any people here have actually had antivirus software on their systems and did not uh, update them in a week. Okay. How many people in over two weeks? Three, a month, six months, a year, several years. Never done it. Okay. Hey, you know what? You're the majority out there. You're the majority. Most people, once they install it, they think they're safe. This is false security. You're not. Um, I've been guilty of it. 
<laughs> I sat there and I'm working on my own system. I actually got infected by the Michelangelo virus, and I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's an old virus, and I had and I had it on a test machine. I had not updated it that system in well over a year. Well, I really wasn't using it, but I started butting around with some old computer games on an older system, things like, you know, Wasteland and Bard's Tale and these things that ran great on 286s and 386s. And I had a borrowed disc from a friend, and <laughs> I stuck it in my system, and I was playing around, and I said, you know what, I should actually run some antivirus software on this because, you know, <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, oh, these dad files were old. And I was like, well, yeah, they sure were. And so I actually tracked down the diskette and cleaned the diskette myself. You know, myself. But, you know, it happens. It happens. Uh, right now, my system is set up to uh, update my dat files daily. Not a joke. I update my dat files daily. And then um, I look at, like, uh, uh, virus bulletin, and I look for <coughs> problems with uh, malicious code out there in the wild, and then I keep updating. There's a lot of really uh, good uh, talks going on. Aside from mine. <laughs> um, there's a lot of really good antivirus products out there. Um, there's a lot of really crappy ones out there. Um, I would recommend that you guys go to a thing called the Virus Bulletin. It's actually a publication in the UK. Um, it's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's expensive for uh, subscription, but it's worth it. Uh, I get them monthly, and I just read them cover to cover. It gives you all kinds of information. And they also do product uh, evaluations, and they're neutral. So they take all the top antivirus products and basically tell you what sucks and what doesn't suck. So um, keep up on it, guys. Keep up on it, because it's important. Um, I actually use two different antivirus products right now on my system. Um, and I had to do this at H2K two weeks ago. I'm going to tell you right now. I do not receive any money or any publications. I don't even get damn t-shirts from any antivirus uh, company out there today. Flat out. My opinions are my own. I have no endorsements. Presently, I'm using FProd on my system. And I'm using Finjin Safe uh, Surf and Shield on my system. I'll tell you why. Almost every single other antivirus product out there right now uses one scanning engine with their DAT files. FPROT uses three different scanning engines with their DAT files. Gives you that much more of a chance to find malicious code. Makes sense. I've had problems with FPROT in the past. Still have problems every once in a while. Uh, there's some flaky issues, but all in all, it's worth, you know, it's worth it. Uh, the reason why I like Finjin, Finjin is actually not an antivirus product. It's an anti-malicious code product that works in conjunction with your antivirus product. You don't use it instead. You use it with. And it works with anything. And what it does is it, out, it takes anything that you bring in from like an email, some type of executable code, and runs it in its own little DMZ sandbox on the computer. And if it sees malicious code, it stops it in its tracks. When the I Love You virus hit, uh, it was the Finchin software that was actually stopping it from spreading at a lot of companies. Everything else it went streaming through. So double up and protect it. Can we hold the questions? Thanks. Finchin, F-I-N-J-A-N. Um, once again, no endorsements. I just happen to like them. Next year, I'll probably like somebody else. Yes, the first two will not work. In fact, it may foobar your whole system depending on the virus. Okay, let's move on. We're going to go over the different types of boot sector viruses. Um, a lot of the old school people just came up with some really intense ideas. We have stealth viruses, polymorphic viruses, encrypting viruses, and any combination of these. I got really nuts with the animation. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, stealth viruses hide in the upper memory block. And uh, even with antivirus software running, if, if you put the antivirus software um, in there with the virus activated in memory, um, it won't see it because it hides. It hides itself specifically from the antivirus systems. Uh, you have to have an emergency boot disk with you that you, please, people, wipe protect this disk. 
Okay. All right. How many people have an emergency boot disk for their systems? How many people can actually remember whether they write protected it or not? Okay. That's good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> because I may be going, damn, my emergency boot disk is now infected with the damn virus. Uh, what do I do? <laughs> I was like, well, um, drop back six yards and punt. I, I don't know. Uh, stealth viruses, pretty cool stuff. Polymorphic boot sector viruses. All right, what polymorphic viruses do, and the reason why they were really cool, um, is that each time they replicate themselves, they change the code. Yes. Now, by changing the code each time, it's not quite the same signature. The way the antivirus products work is they look for a specific signature. If they don't see the signature, they don't think there's a virus. So if you have polymorphic viruses that are changing their code each time, <laughs> yet the antivirus company is going, God, man, damn, I can't find this thing. And it makes it really, really difficult. The nasty ones are when you get the polymorphic encrypting selfing viruses. And there's uh, lots of them. Or the multi-parti polymorphic stealthing encrypting viruses. And by then it's better just uh, throw your laptop out the window and <laughs> buy something new and just say, I don't know this. Or go to Unix. All right. Uh, actually, who can tell me why there's not a whole bunch of Unix viruses out there? That's right, you don't have super user privileges. There's also another reason. Anybody? Normally distributed source data. Mm, sort of, but not really. Actually, the answer I'm looking for is although everything is a file, not everything is inherently executable. Right? If it's not executable, you can't spread, you can't activate it. Um, can anybody tell me right now, and this is a single question, and uh, I'll answer it if the first person doesn't get it right. Why is it that there's more viruses today for Windows than any other operating system? And don't make a joke, give me a real answer. Popularity. Popularity. You're 100% correct. Windows is the dominant operating system in the world. Which is, if you're thinking about the first rule of uh, computer viruses, you need to replicate. Why would you write a virus for Macintoshes if you wanted to replicate it? You write it for the most popular operating system in the world, which is Windows. Windows 95, Windows 98. Actually, I think Windows 95 is still the most popular operating system in the world. If Linux tomorrow became the most popular operating system in the world, you would see viruses for it. And actually, there are viruses out there. <coughs> and there will probably be more. All right, encrypting viruses will encrypt data, or themselves, or both, <laughs> making it more difficult to remove. Um, they may also make it impossible to retrieve your data um, if you remove them incorrectly. Uh, as we mentioned before, the monkey was such a virus. Remove the file infectors here. Like my artwork? My wife's the artist. I'm the computer geek. <laughs> And she looks at things and goes, I could do better. I was like, yeah, I know you could do better. All right, the way file infectors work, and I'm just going to hit the stupid animation thing so I can just go through this whole thing without having to press that stupid button. Would you just go, yes, it looked really cute on the laptop when I was writing you. Oh, damn, I went back. Okay. <laughs> I thought I had more. The way it works is, um, this is the actual file itself. Work with me, people. I know it sucks. What the virus will do is it'll put a capper on the front and a capper on the end. So what it does is the very beginning of the, uh, of the file, this code now states, go over here to the very end of the actual file and run the virus code. And then the end of the virus code then points to the beginning of the actual file to run the actual file that you needed to do, loading the virus into memory. <coughs> Easiest way to identify that is uh, I used to have a script that I ran on my systems uh, weekly that actually did a binary compare to my backups to the actual files that were relevant, executables, com files, so forth. 
Um, and if it found some files that were now larger, that were executable than they were last week, that's a good indication. Who can tell me the maximum size for a com file? What? 64K. What happens if you see a com file that's uh, 1024? <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> so start looking at these files and looking at the numbers. And if you start seeing, uh, there, there are some actual viruses out there that would, each time you ran it, would actually increase the size of the file. And the purpose of this was to fill up your hard drive. So the next thing you knew is like, God, I only have three programs, and my whole hard drive is completely filled. Um, these were back when there was like 10 and 20 gig, or not 10 and 20, 10 and 20 meg files, you know, hard drives out there. You know, when people said, hey, I have a 100 meg hard drive, and people went, whoa, how much did that cost you? $2,000. What a deal! Can you get another one? <laughs> yeah, it's true, it happened. You know, and what these files would do is each time you ran, you know, executable things, or each time you boot up, it would actually start adding to the size of all your executable files. Not just the file itself, but all of the files. So you start ending up with like, okay, now I've got a com file that's like 10 megs, you know, or, you know what's up with this, you know? And uh, ended up with a full hard drive and then nothing worked. And then you had to sit there and go in, and then you really couldn't fix it. Because the way they actually fix the, uh, the, uh, the files, uh, was is they just kind of kill off part of the code. The size stays the same. Your antivirus software didn't shrink your file back to normal. It just deactivated the code sequence, so it just ran the file normally, and all this extra code was left in the front and the big, uh, in the end. So you still ended up with these huge files, and, and that was bad. All right, multi-party viruses will infect both the boot sector and files. So they got you coming and going. So if you got a, a file via email and you activated it, it infected all your executables, all your other type of files, plus it infected your boot sector. And then if you got a disk from somebody and that was infected, it did the same thing and it infected the boot sector and all the files. Uh, these guys were pretty nasty. That is really an annoying animation. <laughs> Remind, just thump me on the head after the thing here. The problem increases the spreading capabilities of the virus by disk, email, or any other way to move media. Uh, multi -part, uh, the multi-party viruses are still the most popular. The anti-exe and the anti-CMOS are two such files, or two such viruses. Anybody ever get hit with anti-CMOS or anti-exe? Either one. Yes, yeah, including myself. I got hit with anti-exe. Um, those two are some of the most popular ones out there, and they're still alive today. Those are particularly nasty. Um, I happen to know of a single uh, virus that's out there that was uh, a type of anti-CMOS virus. Um, I never saw it in the wild. I've only seen it actually running, and I actually don't know if it exists in the wild. And I didn't even know what the hell they named it. Uh, but someone gave me a demonstration of it, and I think he was the one that wrote it, or he got it from his buddy who wrote it. And what it did is it not only did it uh, screw up your CMOS, but it changed the, the admin power, uh, passwords on your, on your CMOS. Uh, so you couldn't even get into your CMOS to fix it. And I was like, oh, that's evil. Can I have a copy? No. Fine, whatever. <laughs> you know, a wonderful research, really. No, no, sorry, it's just proprietary. <laughs> So you're, you're a virus writer. What do you mean it's proprietary? <laughs> you got a copyright on this shit? <laughs> you want to go to these guys and go and say, so tell me, what do paint chips taste like? <laughs> it's like, whatever. You know, it's like, this game of script kitties. How many people have actually been hit by macroviruses? I see a lot of the same hands going, yeah, me, yeah, me again. That's why I'm at this damn talk. God damn it. It's like, I have nothing but a huge festering PC of viruses, you know? What? You? On the corporate network? Yes. Are you responsible for the antivirus? And you're still employed? <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually not getting infected, you're just getting hit with them coming in. 
Okay, so you're doing your job. All right, I apologize. Good for you. You rock, man. <laughs> I was really saying, if you're in, you're for getting hit with all these. I'm going, and you still work? What are you? Dad owns the company? Uh, <laughs> messing with the secretary? What's up here? You know? God, yeah. He's like, yeah. Me, me, me and the president's wife, we're like this, you know? Actually, we're like this on the one over here. You know? God. <laughs> Actually, uh, you brought up a really good point. When I worked at the antivirus uh, company, and I can't really mention who it was, and although I slipped last year and, and mentioned it, so anyone who was here last year actually knows. Um, when I worked there, we would get on the average of 200 to 300 brand new viruses never before seen in the wild each month. And these are not wild viruses, these are brand new, never seen, have to write DAT files for. That number's increased to about 500 to 600 now. All right, the way macroviruses work is someone had the brilliant idea, hey, let's make life easy for all of our end users and give them programming capabilities in their Excel and Word spreadsheets and stuff like that. And we'll let them make everything where they can just press one button and it'll do all this neat stuff for them, you know, for all the lazy people. And then the virus writer sat there and said, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> And they start looking and going, but we'll make it really easy. We'll use the normal dot dot file. You know, and everything will be kind of started. That'd be the starting place. That'd be like the MBR of your Excel spreadsheets. And the virus writers went, say, that's a good idea. <laughs> and they started using that against the, uh, you know, the populace. Uh, your normal dot dot file is your startup. And when you create a default uh, Excel spreadsheet, you know, uh, it's the normal dot dot file that gets uh, run through first, looking for anything that it needs to do. So a lot of these macro viruses would just kind of change the normal dot dot file or replace it and add their own code, you know, still doing what it would normally would do, but there's a little extra stuff there. A uh, really popular one, actually, one of the first ones that came out was the rainbow virus. Anybody get hit with the rainbow macro? Nobody? Well, that was kind of cool. All right, you know Windows. You know how you have your color scheme on Windows, where your borders are one color and the buttons are another color and the frames are another color and you know some flaming guy with a heart on for colors was going nuts. You know, it's like, well, let's do colors. Well, they have colors everywhere. Well, you know, Rainbow would do things like, well, let's just make everything white. <laughs> or let's make everything black or red or blue. Let's just make it, let's say, with one color. <laughs> so you run there, what the? And your taxes, I mean, it's like, uh, man. <laughs> so it's actually pretty funny. Um, but it wouldn't just do like one color. Sometimes they would just start randomly changing all the different colors. You know, every once in a while you'll get hit with that one color scheme, but sometimes you'll get hit like, you know, I want mauve, and I want puce green, and I want bright yellow, and you're going, whoa, damn, jeez. It's like, you know, a rainbow puked on my screen. What's up with that? Good. I mean, it's like, and they were just ugly colors. Why the colors were there in the first place, I have no idea, because nobody who's not on crack would ever use them. All right, Trojan horses. Um, these are programs that are put onto the system by someone or you are tricked into activating them yourself. Most often these are backdoor programs like... Yeah. Okay. Um, now, when I was at H2K and I was going to do this talk, a lot of people said they were because I, I hang out with a lot of people at CDC. Do we have anybody from CDC here? Anybody? Associate members, whatever. Okay. Um, CDC guys, I, I, I hang out with them, you know, every once in a while, you know, you know drinking beer. <laughs> Just don't tell my wife. Um, and people said they're going, well, like, you know, what's your feelings on the CDC? And I say, you think I think they rock. I, I, I think they're uh, they're brilliant. Dill dog, uh, Death Veggie, um, Pond, you know, Kingpin. These guys, uh, they're brilliant programmers. They're brilliant programmers. Do I consider their product a virus? No, I don't. 
I mean, it can be used as a Trojan horse, yes. But what they're doing is they're trying to progress uh, people to like secure their systems and trying to get the people who write the operating systems to you know make a change, you know, and make a difference. Uh, their biggest argument is like, all right, what's the difference between you know SMS and BO2K? <laughs> One's free, one costs you a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> So, um, I have absolutely nothing against them. As a matter of fact, I think they're fantastic people. In a sermon. Fakes and false alarms. That was the slowest, ugliest animation I have on this whole screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was pretty bad, too. All right, the fakes and false alarms. They're spread by email. That's the biggest one. Now, the email itself becomes the virus. How do you tell whether or not the warning you're getting is a fake or false alarm? <laughs> Any arguments? I didn't think so. Read this! <laughs> Next line. <laughs> it's important! This is amazing! First of all, I'd like to point out Microsoft does not send out virus warnings. This just came back from Microsoft. There's a horrible virus that's out there. No. Okay. And read this in huge caps, followed by that. That's using my first name. Okay, click. Uh, but the problem here is, all right, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but I know that some of you here are guilty of this. Oh my God, it's a new virus. I better send everybody on my list this the whole virus information. they got to know about it. And you'll send them. I know some of you guys have sent these to your sysadmins. I know you have. You know how I know? Because you're like... <laughs> I know you have. Uh, because I've read them. I get them. And it's like, no, it's not a virus. No, it's not a virus. And send this to everyone you know. So I like to send it to Bill Gates, you know, and uh, hey, this came from your company. Is it true? I never get a reply. <laughs> um, all right, one question. Go ahead. I didn't catch a single word you said. I am so sorry. <laughs> I was mean, like, I'm trying. It, it, it's your I, I think I know what you're saying is uh, you can actually go to different places and find the hoaxes. And that's actually what I was going to point out. Because um, I, I heard the hoaxes. Oh, I know what he's talking about. Um, yeah. If you're worried about whether or not uh, a fake or false alarm is, whether it's a fake or false alarm, uh, honestly, go to the antivirus uh, uh, companies, and they have spots there on viruses in the wild and the known fakes and false alarms out there. Uh, and Virus Bulletin over in the UK is also a great source for that, too. So before you start spreading these out to everybody, go check there. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. You have to die. Alright. Yeah, but the problem is, is I'm probably going to make a bumper sticker on that and put it on my back of my car. Yeah. Um, Yes. <laughs> nuh uh. I asked mom and she said damn was right. Did anyone actually get the joke? Okay. Actually, yes, you're correct, and I have to be corrected by a kid. How old are you? 11. You're 11. I get corrected by an 11-year-old kid. <laughs> On camera. <laughs> With the person in the audience. Okay. <laughs> no, you're right. That is not the correct definition of damn. I actually did it as a joke. All right. The problem we have with visual, uh, uh, visual basic scripts, and this is the, like, the code of virus preferences right now.
because anybody, anybody can write these. They're really, really simple. Um, and it's, it's the damn script kiddies out there um, doing it. I talk about computer viruses, uh, but never once do I ever tell you guys to go out and write them. There's a reason for that. Uh, my personal opinions are, and these are just my personal opinions, um, writing malicious code that can actually go out there and ruin people's lives is not funny. It doesn't make you elite. It doesn't make you awesome. And you don't impress anybody but your close friends are in your own little tight circles who are nothing but script kiddies anyhow. No one has to write under any circumstances. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the government, the guy next door, a gangbanger, a script key. You don't have the right to ruin another person's lives under any circumstances. And that's why I stand on that. I yeah, like you, Iris. Everybody's like going, well, damn, you got heavy. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. I mean, what's the difference between a virus writer and a guy who uh, spray paints his name on the wall? Doesn't do anything but piss people off. That's making sense to me. Uh, and for the record, no, I have never written a computer virus. I can. I have chosen not to. The I Love You virus, when that came out, um, was actually devastating. The problem I had was the press was going, this genius kid wrote this amazing virus, and I'm going, uh, rats. No, the kid was not a, a genius. Um, he was smart enough to write the virus. Um, so is my mom. And um, so is the maid at the company I work at, the guardsman, the kid that says, would you like fries with that? It, I mean, this doesn't make you brilliant. Visual basic scripting is immensely e easy. You can take someone who's never touched a computer and six months later they could be writing visual basic scripts. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But the problem we have now is that we're going to see a lot more coming down the pipe. Now before we actually go into the conclusion, uh, Steve, can you come up? People ask me what the future of computer viruses is going to be, and I'm going to tell you right now what the future of computer viruses are. <laughs> and Steve, Steve, uh, actually, I met Steve here at, at Age 2K. Uh, he's a great guy, a really br brilliant man. Not a script kitty, a brilliant guy. Uh, and, and we were talking uh, during the conference here, and I'll give you the description I gave at Age 2K. Imagine the whole world staring at this big, huge fan going really fast. And above that, this big truckload of crap. <laughs> and it's tilting towards the fan. That's your future. <laughs> Followed shortly by a shower. What Steve brought to my attention is research has been done to show that you can actually create binary hostile code like boot sector viruses inside embedded into Visual Basic uh, scripts where you don't even have to read the email, you just have to receive it and you could be hit with a boot sector virus or a Trojan horse like BO2K and get nailed. Now how many people here, how many, does that scare the, sh the living hell out of you? Um, it's, it's actually live right now. I mean, you don't even have to read the email. Now, there was a uh, thing with Microsoft where they actually had uh, the vulnerability with Outlook and uh, uh, IA Explorer. And if you, uh, for anyone who's curious, uh, the, the fix is real simple. It was just upgrade uh, IA Explorer 5.5 with the Outlook attachments. Um, unless you're running Windows 2000, and then with Windows 2000, it's uh, Windows 2000 Service Pack 1, which is released tomorrow, I believe. Um, and that's the fix, and they're supposed to be coming out with a patch. But even with that portion fixed, you can still get nailed with some of these things coming down the pipe. So you could actually be working your system, not even re It used to be like, hey, don't worry. Go ahead and read the email. As long as you don't activate the attachments, you're safe. This is not the case anymore. You want to go into more detail? Sure. I got it. 
here. Oh, you're live. Yeah, I'm live. Um, basically, inside a uh, VB script and in some of the more advanced programming features that are available to you there, um, you can treat a binary file like a boot sector or a Trojan horse as a blob of binary data saved to an array. And you have the VB script could save that information to a disk and then execute it like it would execute any other command. So the, the binary itself isn't executed within the VB script. It's carried there as a, as a random blob. It, the VB script itself doesn't know anything about it, but it will write it to your disk and then execute it like it can execute any other type of DLL or command running on the system and actuate the, the boot sector or BOTK, and, but spread at the speed we saw I love you and Melissa. Imagine hundreds of thousands of systems hit with like BO2K. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, okay, I was like, that's cool. I guess it would be cool if you're the guy sending it, but um, or to give you an update for those who um, just a little spot here. Uh, when the I Love You virus hit, um, F Secure identified the virus within two hours of it hitting the US and within three hours traced it all the way back to the person who wrote it. So if you think they can't find you, you are so dead wrong. Anyhow, that's my talk. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll take questions. Yes, I That's a really brilliant question. The question here is why won't they detect uh, compressed executable code? Because it doesn't follow the, uh, the signature file, which is why I said use F or the FinGen software. Uh, if you ever go to like a, sec a security conference other than something like this, and FinGen's there, their demonstration is actually very brilliant. What they do is they take BO2K and they have uh, an antivirus product software and they try to activate BO2K and the antivirus software detects it in a heartbeat. Well, then they run it through a compression process which doesn't de uh, decompress when it executes. And then they run it and the antivirus software completely misses it. And then they activate their software <laughs> and they do it and boom, their software hits it because it runs it in a ZMZ and says, hey, what? This is a uh, malicious code. We'll stop it. That's why I said back yourself up. But uh, the reason why is because it changes the signature drastically. And once they figure out the signature for that one, you can compress some of these three, nine, twelve, sixty times and change the signature. Sir. How do they track it? I don't know. I wasn't involved with that. Uh, but I did. I, I got to see some of the white papers. You know, so they weren't lying. <laughs> Do you think that's the only vulnerability? <laughs> yeah, that's the only one that's been released. Yeah. The U was the cut out Right. Okay. Uh, the thing is, is that's exactly right. The, the, the problem that we deal with right now is we'll discover a vulnerability, but the moment someone else discovers another vulnerability, um, it gets explo yeah, exploited immediately. Microsoft Lookout. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft Lookout. <laughs> yeah, I like to go into the device mangler myself and play around in there, too. So, Next question. Anybody? Does uh, having Windows scripting codes uninstalled prevent that? Yes. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. It gets reinstalled. It gets reinstalled. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't heard anything, but it wouldn't surprise me. Sounds like a cool idea. Yeah. Actually, it sounds like a cool idea. Uh, I'm going to research it. Um, if there's any viruses that attack the antivirus software, yeah, the multi uh, multi uh, multi 
the, yes, the file infectors, yes, they'll actually attack the, uh, the thing, but the antivirus software products themselves actually check their own executable before executing to see if they're actually uh, done. So I don't know if any viruses directly that actually prevent that. Um, how much time do we have? I think uh, I got about four minutes. Is the next speaker here? No? All right. Yes? Okay, I'll be off here in a second here. One more question, then we're gone. All right. Are there any products recommended for compassion and self-service? You can do it. You can set it up in your uh, send Yeah, like you said, you can set it up in your send now. Um, I mean, what I do is I actually I block viruses at the firewall using F-Secure's uh, antivirus software at the firewall level. So it it hits the firewall and says, "Hey, you're out of here. You're out of here. You're out of here." Um, also, by the way, for something like that with a firewall antivirus product, um, really fast machine, lots of memory, lots of CPUs. Trust me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Anyhow, that's my talk. Thank you much. Thank you.